Um, and I guess I'll just start into announcements myself before I ask if anybody else has any announcements. I'll give you some time to think if you have any announcements or questions or comments or what have you. So this week is gonna be a little bit jumbled between what we're starting today and what we will be looking at Wednesday. Today, we're going to look at the normal distribution continued. And then um, on Wednesday via the lecture videos, we're gonna do this material. So this stuff is going to be via videos on Wednesday. And it's gonna be a little bit jumbled for a little bit in this class um, because I'm trying to finish up some stuff about the central limit theorem from last week, showing you why it's so important maybe. And then I'm gonna start in on some new material that's going to come back into play with the central limit theorem once we look at it um, again. So we're gonna to have to meanwhile introduce some new stuff this week so we can start combining all the things next week. Um, I'm pretty excited for it because this is really where we get to the heart of why statistics is, you know, a valuable discipline. Um, okay, that wasn't so much an announcement as what was happening today and this week. I do have an announcement though. It just left my mind while I started talking. The announcement is I have come up with uh, a better solution to submitting course notes and our tutorials in this class. I have created a shared Google folder for each of you, and I am the only other person on this planet who has access to your shared Google folder. And you will submit your course notes and your tutorials via this shared Google folder. Um, I would like both the R Markdown and the compiled HTML files in the shared Google folder that I will give you access to via a formal invitation um, later today. I will send out an email myself from my at mail.csuchico.edu account. And I will put Math 350 in the subject line so your Math 350 filters pick it up appropriately. In fact, I believe Google on my behalf has already sent you an invitation to this shared Google folder from my at mail.csuchico.edu account, but you might not have seen it because it didn't hit your math 350 folder. And that's okay. I wanted to announce this sort of thing before it's before I sent out emails anyway, but uh, Google sent out emails for me. There's nothing I could do about it. So uh, you will submit your course notes and tutorials, both the R Markdown and the HTML files via this share, shared Google folder. You'll just drag them into the folder and let them upload. But you will also need to upload to this fo shared folder whatever plots or images or pictures you want to show up in your outputted HTML files. So if you have let's say files named picture one, picture two, picture three, and those are supposed to go into your course notes, then you will also need to upload these files into your course notes. Now up on Piazza, let's see if we can even show really quick. Piazza, here is a really nice um, post to the Piazza, um, forums about how to include a picture in your uh, course notes. What I really like about this is that it tells you to put the pictures or the images in the exact same folder as your course notes. So when you upload all of your course notes or your tutorials to my uh, to our shared Google folder, you should follow this strategy here and I will include a link to this Piazza post in the email I send out later today. And then you can name the file inside your R Markdown document just based on the file name. And as a follow-up, I show you how you can include all of your pictures in a subfolder 
where the subfolder itself lives in the same folder as your R Markdown file. So this is going to be our strategy to submit course notes and the tutorials. I will send out an email later today. Actually, I'm going to send out two emails later today. One is going to be my standard YouTube videos have been posted. And then the other one is going to be specific about submitting course notes and tutorials. Um, and then this is a good post on Piazza for how to deal with images so that I'll be able to see them after you submit them. We've got a, about a month ahead of us to get this right. So I do anticipate you all to try it, email me and or show up into office hours to ask me any questions about things not working. This is like your month long um, announcement to say, we need to make sure you can submit things correctly by the end of the semester. Let's try it now and get it right. Um, okay, those were my announcements. Things to come this week and things to come for the rest of the semester, specifically how to submit stuff with a few more details to follow in emails. Does anybody have any questions about things to come this week or things for the rest of the semester, how to submit materials or questions otherwise? Blank stairs, blank chat. Sometimes I forget about the chat and y'all are like blowing it up and then I need to come look at it and I get caught up, but nobody's saying anything these days. It's too nice out. Everybody wants to go hang out outside, not sit in their house and watch me talk about math. Okay, I'm getting started because nobody seems to be asking any questions. So that tells me that everybody understands everything perfectly, right? Okay, here we go. Today is gonna to be about this crazy rule that is named the 68, isn't this the worst name you've ever seen? 68959.7 rule. That is actually what they call this rule. It's a terrible name. I'll tell you why it's a terrible name. It's a terrible name because it's too long. It's too obnoxious and it's only a rule developed before they had reasonable access to computers. I don't know when this rule was created, but it was a long time ago. And it only became a rule because it was easy to memorize, relatively easy to memorize. But now that we have modern machines to do some pretty serious calculations for us, we're going to convert this rule to using quantiles. So this is going to kind of be like flipping things around and we're gonna use quantiles to interpret this rule better. Now, why do we need to use quantiles to interpret this rule better? Well, it's gonna lead us back to the central limit theorem, which we talked about last week. And specifically, we're gonna to get to a first discussion about how is the central limit theorem used? Now, it's gonna be a first discussion. We're not gonna have time to complete the discussion in this lecture. That's fine. We'll come back to it many times before the semester ends. Uh, it's actually, this is kind of where the course starts becoming incredibly useful. Uh, up until this point, it's kind of been building lots and lots of tools and new machinery and looking at math in a kind of crazy new way. But once we have all these tools in place, we then can start to understand why statistics is a thing at all. So we're just going to get jumped. We're just going to jump into this terrible rule and I'm going to introduce it with pictures. 68, 95, 99.7% rule. Okay. Suppose you have a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance, sigma squared. Then just as a quick note, then sigma, which is, and I know this is silly, the square root of sigma squared 
is the standard deviation. I haven't focused too much on the standard deviation before because it doesn't come up too much until this discussion. So it's just the square root of the variance. It's not too bad. So I will draw the best normal distribution I can. It happens to be at an angle. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that's the best I can do freehand right now. <laughs> Let's put the mean mu right there on the x-axis. And then I'll just put this sigma up in the top right shoulder of this plot. Now, the way this rule goes is if you start at the mean mu and you add one standard deviation and you subtract off one standard deviation from the mean mu, what you get is bounds that capture approximately 68% of the area under this function. What you get by adding one standard deviation and subtracting one standard deviation, and then looking at the amount of area within that interval, you get approximately 68% of the area under this density function. Okay, that doesn't seem super cool, but it turns out to be just part of this rule and it will be cool in a little bit. Okay, let's start back at the beginning and try again. If you subtract off two standard deviations and add two standard deviations, and you look at the area under the density function in this interval, you get approximately 95% of the area. So that's all of this is approximately 95% of the area within two standard deviations of the mean. Okay, let's erase those lines and try this rule all over again. They call this rule the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule because it tells you approximately how much area is within one, two, and three standard deviations of the mean. And it turns out that the normal distribution has exponentially decreasing tails. So those tails, even though how I drew them, it kind of looks like they point back up. They absolutely do not point back up. They converge down off to negative and positive infinity at an exponential rate so fast such that within three standard deviations, there is approximately 99.7% of the area under this function. Since there's a total of 100% or just one under this density function, what's left in the tails is only 0.3%, a very small amount. Okay, how'd that go for our first take at the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule? Any questions on that? that? Nice, thanks. Any other comments, questions before we move on? Okay, then we're gonna try to do this rule in R, just the same, okay? So in R, we're gonna use a function named P norm, and P norm by default will choose mean mu equal to zero and a standard deviation equal to one. Those are particularly easy numbers because if I want to add one to the mean mu equal to zero, then really I just use the value one because one plus zero is one. And if I want to add two standard deviations, I just add two. And if I want to add three standard deviations, all I need is the number three. And I think you can see the same pattern for the subtraction, negative one, negative two, negative three. Okay. So we're going to jump back and forth between R and some pictures here so we can 
uh, try to visualize the calculations that R is doing for us. So we're going to look at the 68, 90, whoops, 95, 99.7% rule. And in R, we're going to use this function named P norm, P, because we are finding probabilities. Probabilities are area under functions, and that's what we've been dealing with uh, so far in this discussion. Norm, because we're on the normal distribution. So P, because we're interested in probabilities. Norm, because it's a normal distribution. And P norm of one is going to calculate all the area to the left of one, all the area under the density function less than one. All the area under the density function less than one. But if we consider all the area under the function less than one, we get a little bit more than we actually want. So if we go back to the one dealing with just one, if we calculate all the area to the left, notice that we get all of this area past negative one. We don't want that area past negative one. So a little trick we do when doing this on computers is to subtract off the area we don't want. Okay, so let's just do it really quick. P norm of negative one subtracted from P norm of one. And what do we see? Is indeed approximately 68% of the area lives under that function. In between positive one and negative one standard deviations. Okay, let's try this picture just one more time. P norm in R by default puts you on a normal distribution with mean equal to zero and standard deviation equal to one. So if we're going to calculate P norm of one, it calculates the probability for us. That is all the area to the left. But relative to our 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, we don't want the area to the left of negative 1. We want to stop calculating area right here. And we do not want this. So the trick is to take p norm of 1, all the area we want, plus some we don't, and subtract off the area we don't want. And that will leave us with approximately 68% in the middle, as you can see here. OK, does somebody want to try to guess what the calculation is going to look like for the um, justification of the 95% version? P Two minus p norm of negative two. Exactly. It sounds. Like, yeah, we had two answers on the spot. I appreciate. I appreciate that. And indeed, we get approximately ninety-five percent of the area in between two and negative two standard deviations away from the mean. It just happens to be that p norm picks a mean of zero in a standard deviation of one for us automatically. OK, so it sounded like two people answered last time, one of whom got to give the final answer. How about that other person give us the answer for um, P norm for the justification of the 99.7% per, uh, rule? So P norm 3 minus P norm negative 3. Nice. Thank you. And indeed, that's where the 99.7 comes from. OK, so with pictures, I don't think this is so bad. I think the pictures really help us understand what's going on.
but we're going to try to flip the script a little bit. The second bullet point in today's agenda is recognizing that we can do these exact calculations on a computer. We don't need this silly rule because we have access to absolutely free software that can do these calculations for us. So we're going to Um, oh, how did I say it? I just want to title these right, other side. We're going to consider the other side of this using quantiles. Okay. So I'm going to start us with a normal distribution. Just the same as we had for P norm. But now I'm going to look at the other side of this. I'm going to look at the inverse of this. What we had before was we specified values on the x-axis, and then we calculated probabilities from them. Probabilities specifically between two numbers. Well, that's not very symmetric. That's a little bit better probabilities between these two numbers. We had values on the x-axis. Let me remind you in the R code, we provided the values on the x-axis and what we got out were probabilities. When I mean I wanna flip this around, I'm going to now provide probabilities and ask R to give me values on the x-axis. I'm now going to be able to say, I want exactly 68%. Now let's not do 68%, let's start with 95%. I want exactly 95% of the area in between these two numbers. What are those two numbers? Previously, we had values on the x-axis and we calculated probabilities. We're now doing the opposite. I have a probability are, please give me the two values on the x-axis between which there is exactly 95%. This is what computers can do for us these days. It doesn't seem that magical to you, but it is if you've ever been on the other side of this without computers. So we're going to get R to calculate these two quantiles for us. So quantiles will come from the function that starts with the letter Q, and we're on the normal distribution, so it's going to be the function Q norm. Q norm calculates all the area to the left. All the area to the left. It does not stop here because your picture has this pretty line. It calculates all the area to the left. My question to you all is, how much area is to the left of whatever number this is? There's certainly 95% here, but how much is in this left tail? How much area under the density function exists in this left tail from here to the left? 2.5, yeah, like Gary nice. says. Appreciate it. Both of you are absolutely correct. 2.5% lives in this left tail. So if I'm going to calculate this number in R, I need to plug in the probability that lives, um, that exists for 95% plus the 2.5%. So that is 0.95%. That 1.9, let's call it 6, that is this number right here, 1.96. That Q norm finds for us a quantile specifically the quantile that puts 97.5% of the area less than the number it finds for us. So Q norm gives us this quantile by finding this value such that it puts 
97.5% of the area less than. Okay, so you all tell me what R code do I need to find this number right here? What R code do I need to find this number right here? Q norm of 0 0.025. Very nice. And you see here that the normal distribution is perfectly symmetric. Can't you tell it's perfectly symmetric from my pretty picture? The normal distribution is perfectly symmetric. Now, we have found the numbers, the two numbers, that exactly give us 95% of the area between them. That's not an approximation anymore. Those are basically as exact as computers can get to date. And you can even see they're much more exact than this number here. I've done some rounding myself. But relative to the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, you can see why two makes sense. Two makes sense because 1.96 is really close to two. It's really, really close to two. So that seems like a relatively good approximation, but we can and do do better in this class. Okay, here's the thing. These calculations happened for a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But in fact, we've already learned how to change the mean and the standard deviation to something else and get these sorts of calculations for any other normal distribution where the mean is not zero and the standard deviation is not one. We've done this before. All you have to do is scale and then shift this normal distribution. And if you appropriately scale and then shift this distribution, you get, oh, whoops, this new value that puts 97.5% of the area less than this quantile on this new distribution. Now, if you've recognized that Q norm has arguments for the mean, then you'll can see that indeed these two lines of code give us the exact same numbers. Why do I force you into this one? This, whoops, is more common. This is what they use in the world of applied statistics. It's this form. So let me see if I can remind us of this form. If you start with a normal distribution, like the one displayed here on the page, and my little fingers here are going to recreate this distribution. If you start with this distribution centered at zero and scaled so that the standard deviation is equal to one, well, if you shift the distribution to a new mean mu to be whatever number you want, you could shift it positive or negative. I don't know if my hands are going in the right way for you. Yeah, anyway, you can shift the normal distribution wherever you want by adding some amount to it to give it a new mean mu. And similarly, you can multiply the distribution by some amount to give it a new standard deviation. So you can shift and scale a distribution. You can shift and scale a normal distribution however you want. Now, in order to do that for these quantile calculations, these are the scaling and then the shifting you have to do. And to prove to you that this works for whatever quantile you might be interested in, we can do a similar sort of calculation for the 
2.5% quantile. And we get out the same numbers. This is the more common choice for how to shift and scale a normal distribution originally centered at mean zero and standard deviation of one to whatever you want. And indeed, you could shift it the other way and make it smaller if you wanted. It doesn't have to always be wider. So what we're getting at is this is the form we're going to use in order to apply the central limit theorem. In order to apply the central limit theorem, we will replace M with an estimate of the mean and replace S with an estimate of the standard deviation. Once we replace M and S based on data alone, then we can effectively use the normal distribution. Once we, okay, this argument takes a little bit, so I'm going to try to slow down here for uh, probably a good while because we just learned about the central limit theorem. Once we replace M and S with estimates from data alone, as long as M is some sort of sample mean. As long as M is some sort of sample mean. So if you had a vector named X and you just took the mean of that vector X, added up all the numbers divided by however many there are, then the central limit theorem tells us that the sample mean will be approximately normal. you had a vector of data and you calculated the mean on that vector of data, and then you imagine that vector is a random variable, then that random variable has a distribution and the distribution is approximately normal. The central limit theorem tells us that the shape of repeated sample means. Repeated sample means is like I went out and collected my own data set, calculated a mean. You went out, collected your own data set, calculated a mean. Your friend went out, calculated their own data set, and calculated their own mean. And then we made a histogram of the sample means. They would look approximately normal. The end product of the central limit theorem is a normal distribution. Because the end product is a normal distribution, we can use Q norm. Because the central limit theorem tells us that we have a normal distribution in the end, we can use Q norm. We don't know what normal distribution we're going to have. We don't know what the mean is. We don't know what the standard deviation is. So we estimate those from the data, and we use the central limit theorem to tell us that we can use the normal distribution. And then we scale and shift the distribution appropriate to the data. OK, here's where I'm going to pause, that you all ask some questions, because this is the point in the semester where we've just crammed together like three to six, depending on how you're counting, different topics from the course into one idea. So you wouldn't use like Q gamma or Q binomial or Q binom. You have to use Q norm based on the central limit theorem. Perfect. But you might get data or you might get a distribution that it is a gamma distribution or is. Right. Okay, so here's the crazy part. Your original data, can come from a gamma distribution. Your original data can come from the binomial distribution. 
your original data can come from any distribution you may have never heard of. There's an infinite number of them. But as long as you take a mean of your data, as long as you calculate mean of your vector x, then what you're going to get in the end is a normal distribution. I think that was See, that Jared, if I believe. Jared, that was yeah. an excellent point. You can start with something not normal. But as long as you're calculating a mean, you end up with something that is normal. Other questions, comments? And your comments don't have to be like super smart. They can just be, what, what? And we can work with that. Can you repeat what you just said? Like you said, if you take the mean, then it becomes a normal distribution? Yeah, so the idea with the central limit theorem is to imagine that all of your data are random variables themselves. Before you observe your data, you don't know what value it's going to have. Imagine flipping a coin, but then covering the answer without looking at it first. You don't know if it's heads or tails. The way we think about that is as a random variable. In that particular case, you have a random variable with a Bernoulli distribution. Okay. Now, imagine without adding up, without looking at this value, that you did this 10 times. So now you have 10 different flips of a coin whose value you don't know. You suddenly have 10 random variables. Well, we can write down on a pen and paper some capital letter X to represent each coin. And if we added up all of those coins, those values we don't know, which we represent as a capital X, if we added them all up and divided by however many there are, we have a new random variable the new random variable happens to be the sum of 10 random variables. So this new random variable has its own distribution. This new random variable has its own distribution. And the central limit theorem tells us that the distribution of the sample mean, that is the distribution of sums of numbers, sums of numbers divided by however many there are. The distribution of means is normal. You started with, by no, with Bernoulli data. You started with Bernoulli data. But then you added them all up and divided by however many there are. The distribution of the mean, that is the quantity that was just added and divided by however many there are, has a normal distribution as dictated by the central limit theorem. The only like reasonable way you can imagine this is as if I flipped a coin 10 times and calculated my own mean. And then Jacob, you flipped a coin, the same coin essentially, 10 times and calculated your own mean. And then Jacob, your friend flipped a coin and calculated their own mean. And then their friend flipped this coin 10 times and calculated their own mean. If we did this like 100 times, so we each flipped a coin 10 times and calculated our own mean, we now have 100 sample means. Does that make sense? These sample means have a distribution. There is a shape to these sample means. And the central limit theorem tells us it is approximately normal. Excellent, Gary, so glad to hear it. Uh, the shape of our 100 sample means is approximately normal. Okay, because it's approximately normal, we can use the normal distribution, Q norm. We don't know what mean and what standard deviation this normal distribution will have, so we estimate the mean 
and we estimate the standard deviation. And then we can shift and scale the normal distribution that was previously centered at zero and scaled to one can now be scaled and shifted as appropriate to our data. This indeed works with completely random data, I think. The way I understand completely random data, Josh, can you help me understand what you think completely random data means? Is that like there's no like probability, like it's just random, uh, like dots all over the graph kind of thing? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Right. I think once you have Josh's realization that there is such little structure to this theorem that it works so broadly that you begin to understand um, the real power of this. Nice, nice. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start getting into the implications of this then. Imagine I gave you a coin and you flipped it three times and you saw heads, heads, tails. Imagine I gave you this coin and then you flipped it three times. Heads, heads, tails. Here's a rhetorical question I want you to think about. There's no good answer here. Is this coin fair? You saw heads, heads, tails. Is this coin fair? Or is it a biased coin? There's no know. good answer here. <laughs> the best answer here is we don't know. The best answer is we don't know. There's no great answer, but that's clearly the best answer. We don't know. So what we could do is try to form a range of numbers, a range of numbers that will tell us where is what values are most likely for the true expectation. Remember, that's what we're trying to do in the world of statistics is estimate expectations using data alone. So certainly, if we calculated an estimate of the expectation of this Bernoulli distribution, the estimate is 2 thirds, 0.66. Is that estimate equal to 0.5? Absolutely not. Do we expect a coin, even a fair coin, flipped three times to give us the answer 0.5? No. Do you expect a fair coin, if I gave you an absolutely fair coin, do you expect it to give you exactly one half heads out of three flips? not possible. It's not possible. It is absolutely not possible. So it's unreasonable to expect the estimate right here. I'm sorry. It's unreasonable to expect the estimate based on three data points to be exactly 0.5. But what, what we the... would like to do, give me one second, Jacob, and then I'll come back. Yeah. But what we'd like to do is create a range of numbers that helps us understand the uncertainty associated with our estimate. We would like a range of numbers that says, well, based on the data we have, we're fairly sure that the true expectation is somewhere in this range of numbers. Jacob, I'll stop there and let you go. I uh, should be being kind of funny. What if the coin lands, lands on its side? You know, the day that happens, I really hope you sent, take a picture and then spread it around the internet. Because I think <laughs> that'll be like the new best meme. Whatever year that is, that'll be the best thing that happened that year. 
Okay, here we go. We use the central limit theorem to quantify this interval, this interval that will tell us we are fairly sure, let's say like 95% sure, that the true expectation is somewhere in this interval. So you go like this. You take the mean of your data and you add the square root of the variance divided by your sample size times Q norm. And I'm just gonna put both of these into one calculation. So this is the Q norm for the upper bound. That's like one stand, two standard deviations above the mean. And this is two standard deviations below the mean, but done exactly. And this interval here quantifies for us literally the uncertainty associated with estimating the mean using only three data points. One more time, this interval here literally quantifies our uncertainty in estimating the expectation known as the mean using only three data points. This interval right here is literally the range for which 95% of future sample means will live in. It is the range in which 95% of future sample means will live. Future sample means that depend on only three data points. So when I asked you, how certain are we that this coin is fair? We have no idea. It could be anywhere the true expectation could be anywhere as low as 0.13 all the way up to 0.132, which doesn't even make sense because the central limit theorem is an approximation. Okay, this is a big day. This is our first of many discussions about applying the central limit theorem. There's a few things to take away. One, the sample size here is crucially important. The more data you get, the closer the estimate will be to the true expectation. This sample size here is crucial. The more data you get, the closer your estimate will be to the true expectation. How does a range of numbers that represents your uncertainty change as your sample size gets bigger? Well, if your sample size gets bigger, and that means your estimate is getting closer, then your uncertainty is shrinking. Your uncertainty narrows down until, pop, in the limit, you have one number left, the right number. In the limit, if you could, but you can't, in the limit, as your sample size goes off to infinity, your mean, your estimate will converge to the exact right number. How can we look at that? Let's change this example around a little bit. and generate, let's say, 100 data points instead of just three. And look what happened to our interval. It vastly shrank down. With 100 data points, we are 95% sure that the true expectation is somewhere between 0.44 and 0.64. Okay, this is a fun game to play. So I'm gonna leave this code up for a little bit because it is a fun game to play. There's a lot of things you can see happening here 
in this line of code. As your sample size goes up, your interval shrinks greatly. Your computer cannot take limits. So you just have to trust that if you keep adding zeros, this interval is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Also, like Josh pointed out earlier, this does not have to be the binomial distribution. You can start out with whatever you want. Explore this code. In fact, I have another video following this that is basically five more minutes of me repeating this same argument, and I'll post it for Wednesday. It's 3.50 now. I'm going to stop recording here.